All right, good morning. I'm happy to be with you. I thank you so much for being here. We have our teenagers with us this morning, not to put you on the spot, but yay, our teenagers are here. Uh, they've decided to come investigate what's happening on uh, our side of the wall, and uh, then they're going to uh, go critique it. So, uh, uh, but I don't want to hear about that. No, I really don't. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about what I think is the secret of the ages, and wouldn't you like to know? Because I've certainly been looking for a long time. And what I believe it is, is that the world as we see it, what we see out here, and what we experience is all um, in our subjective mind. That's the secret of the ages, that what's out here is a reflection of in here. And I know what you're thinking. Uh-uh, what I see out here is not a reflection of this in here. And maybe it's a reflection of somebody else's in here, but it's not my in here. Well, I've got to tell you that it's all of us together, right? The secret of the ages is that the world, as we see and experience it, is our own subjective consciousness objectified. It's the way we believe that's outpictured here. So our world is a reflection of our beliefs. Everybody knows that in the science of mind, that what you believe has everything to do with what we're experiencing right now. You know, it also has to do with what our convictions are, with what we really deeply, deeply hold within ourselves. But you know, circumstances and other people are never responsible for what happens to us. That's the hard part of the science of mind, to say it's never about the other person. If I'm unhappy, it's never about the other person. If I'm not feeling well, it's not about the other person. If I don't have enough of whatever it is, it's never about the other person. Science of mind says I have to look within my own consciousness. What am I believing? What am I thinking? What am I giving my attention to? We teach that we are all divine, and yet we're having a human experience. And what we mean by that is that you and I, we are all spiritual beings. Most of you, most of you, most of you is the spirit part of you, the part we don't see. And yet here we are on Earth, we have to have a vehicle, this physical body, for the spirit that we are to express through. So spiritual beings, I think, are here on Earth because we're here to learn and we're here to love. I think that's basically it. Now, everything, everything happens from the inside out. We are affected only by what happens really inside of us. So, you know, a group of us are getting ready to go on a little trip. Uh, we're going to go to Bhutan. We're going to go to Thailand and then Bhutan. And this is a very interesting time to be traveling, don't you think? I do. <laughs> I do. I think it's a really interesting time. But I also think that when there is doubt or when there's fear, that's really the time to move in closer to your spiritual practice, right? It's not the time to say, oh my God, I'm so worked up, I'm so fearful, I have so many doubts, I don't have time to pray, I can't possibly meditate. No, when fear and doubt show up, that's exactly when we need to pray, when we need to treat, when we need to affirm with the most sincerity we can muster. Look, Ernest Holmes used to say this, and I think it's one of the greatest things he ever said. He said, there is only one life, this life this life that we are living right now is the life of God. This life is perfect, and this life is my life now. There is only one life. This life is God. This life is perfect, and this life is my life right now. That has to be my mantra. You know, and maybe for you, it will fit as well. To remember, as I navigate through the experiences of the world and my consciousness is bumping, bumping up against the rough edges of everybody else's consciousness, and they're bumping up against my rough edges for sure, then this will help me stay in a centered place and not be at the effect of external conditions. Look, we have to know that in our teaching, we believe that God is already doing everything God is going to do. So, has God got a solution for this appearance of coronavirus? Yes, it already exists. The healing already exists in the mind of God. I'm trying to remember where I read this, but I know somewhere Ernest Holmes says if he could get a thousand people, that's not that many actually, a thousand people to really agree to an idea and hold to it, then they would have a demonstration. Are there a thousand people who believe that the coronavirus could be healed? I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. Most of them are here even if you're not traveling. 
Yeah, that, you know, so it has to start with in the mind, and now think about this, in the mind of God, the healing, the cure, the inoculation, whatever it is, already exists. It's not like God saying, oh, geez, this is a tough one. I just can't figure out what to do with this virus, you know? I'm not really sure where it came from, how it started. That does not exist in the mind of God. So if God already has the answer and God is making the gift, we have to be open and willing and receptive to that answer, to that solution. Because it's not like God is going to do something, you know, like, you know, people say, oh, it's going to take so long before we find a cure for this virus. God doesn't need time. There is no time in the mind of God. Enough of us need to start agreeing right now, first of all, that there is nothing outside of me that can have any negative effect on me. That's what we teach. And second of all, this appearance of a virus, God already has the solution, the cure, the healing, and we need to be open and willing and receptive to that coming forward into our experience because we know that would be a blessing for everybody on the planet. To take one thing, wouldn't it be nice to have that wiped off our plate? Like, okay, whew, at least that's nothing to worry about anymore. I believe that that's available to us, and as students of new thought, as metaphysical spiritual students, that becomes our responsibility to say, I need to know. I need to be on the side of the fence that says, the healing is happening right now. Now, this is not just true about coronavirus. This is true about every malady that we have on the face of the planet right now. In the mind of God, the healing already exists. In the mind of God, the cure already exists. In the mind of God, solution already exists we just need to get with the program. And what I mean by get with the program is we need to be open and available and receptive to this greater wisdom being revealed on earth as it is in the mind of God. Nothing has the power to affect us except our own mind. So years ago, over 2,500 years ago, the Buddha said, what we are is what we have thought for years. So think about that. What is my consistent tone of thought around particular areas of my life? Because you know, the more a spiritual truth is repeated, the more it sinks in. This is why we affirm, this is why we treat, this is why we visualize, this is why we have goals, so that we are in touch with a greater spiritual truth. We're reminding ourselves of it again and again and again because the more, the more a truth is repeated, the more it sinks in. You know, to know a spiritual truth, oh, God is all there is, you know, but we don't apply it, the harder it is to apply it in a practical way when we really, really need it. You know, I thought about this a lot this week, and the way we feel about ourselves affects every aspect of our existence, right? Because it's an inside job. The way we feel about ourselves absolutely affects our interpersonal relationships. The way we feel about ourselves definitely, definitely affects our health. The way we feel about ourselves absolutely affects our ability to uh, create money and abundance in our life. The way we feel about ourselves has significant influence on our creative expression, and on and on and on. This is not to be confused with, when I say feeling, uh, the way you feel about yourself, this is not about conceit or narcissism or being a bragger or anything like that. Look, the light of God, the light of the universe is in us, and it has to pass through the transparency of our idea of ourselves. The light of God is within us, and it has to pass through the transparency of who we really believe ourselves to be, of what the transparency of what we really deep down believe we deserve, because that's actually what we're always getting. You know, we are always, always getting what we deep, deep, deep down believe we deserve. And so if you don't like what you're getting, what that means is that you get to go in and, and do some changing, some, some spiritual house cleaning on the inside. You know, to say we are part of God is not to brag, it's just true. You know, people say, oh, that's blasphemy. It's, oh, that's nonsense. The, it, the blasphemy in new thought is to say that I'm nothing. You know, if you say you are not much, if you say you are not worthy, if you think that you are not lovable, that is a blasphemy because that does not acknowledge the perfect presence of the infinite spirit that's already within you. You know, it's not like, oh, everybody else is part of God but me. Really, you're that special? I'm sorry. You're special, just not that special, okay? You know, that, that everybody comes from a different background. I get it, you know? And so 
this morning we could probably all agree that everybody's parents did the best they could given what they had. You know, I mean, there are very, very few instances, I believe, where people are deliberately out to do bad, right? But somehow, we got the message, probably, in some way, that something about us was not okay. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's not so much that, and see, here's the thing, it's not so much that we got that message or heard that message, it's that we believed it. That's the problem, is that we believe those things. That we, you know, particularly when we're young, we think, oh, adults know so much more than us, right? But the truth does not change. The truth is eternal. We, you know, so here we are, we're this perfect little spirit, and we got covered with fears, this perfect little spirit that got its feelings hurt, or we got guilt on us, or anger, or resentment, or something like that. But the negative focus, I think, from, from early on in life comes from lots and lots of things. So we could say, well, parents and other adults and teachers and friends and experiences that we have, but when we're young, you know, we make decisions about ourselves and we make decisions about life. Some, and, and often, often those decisions are not the most supportive, life-affirming ideas. We say, oh, something is wrong with me. Everything is my fault. I don't do anything right. I, you know, I, I, I have to settle for less. I'm not good enough. Or that universal doubt that I talk about, that idea that there is just not enough. There's not enough love for me. There's not enough opportunity for me. There's not enough money for me. There is just not enough. Intellectually, I understand that this is not true. You know, it's not a spiritual truth. I remember a while back, um, when my nephew was a little younger, he was in Cub Scouts, and he was involved in a pine wood derby. I don't know if you what that is, if you know what that is, but they give you a block of pine wood and some little wheels, and you are supposed to whittle a car, and and it goes down this track, you know, and it's and it's you know when you're a kid, it's it's a pretty exciting and big deal. Um, I was terrible at this, by the way. Um, it it really brought up all kinds of stuff for me uh, when my nephew was preparing for, he says, Uncle Mark, I'm going to be in the Pinewood Derby. And oh, isn't that wonderful? And on the inside, I'm going, oh my God, why is this such a, why is this such a big deal? I mean, I haven't been in a Pinewood Derby in over 50 years. How can this, but you know, I had thoughts about that experience, and those thoughts were still in there, you know? It touched a place in me, you know, uh, where it brought up my stuff and some delusion I had. You know, so I have to forgive the past because that came up. I have to forgive the people involved. I have to forgive anybody and everybody. So I get to heal and be free. You know, we live our lives like the decisions we make are always, always so. Like they are real or accurate. So it will probably not come as a surprise to many of you who've been around for a while, but when I was in junior high, I had a couple of uh, abundant years. In other words, when it came time for school shopping, we had to go to the department store that had a husky department. <laughs> this was one of the worst experiences each year for me during those husky years. Because inevitably, what would happen is there would be much moaning and gnashing of teeth before the shopping trip. We'd get to this particular department store that had a husky section and what we would hear over the loudspeaker system is, we need customer service to Huskies. Look for the woman with the fat kid, <laughs> you know? And it was just, so, it's, it's, what it seemed, it's what I remember, you know? That's what I remember, okay? <laughs> yep, the woman with the fat, fat kid who's on the verge of crying, he needs pants. Do we have anything that big? <laughs> oh. oh. Just shoot me now. Just shoot me now. Right? Oh, it, was, it was just the most embarrassing, humiliating thing. Uh, but you know, with time, I realized it's not what other people say. It's what I say after what other people say. You know? So if somebody comes up to you and says, you're a turnip. You say, no, actually, I'm not. But thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Turnips can be quite nice, particularly at Thanksgiving, you know? So I know we are here to give and receive love. I know that every person here is here to make a difference. Now, the truth is that God loves us right now. 
And, and, and the way we can experience that is if we meditate and just allow that in, that I am loved by God. And this is important because our mind affects how we experience ourselves. You know, Scripture said, Know ye not that ye are the sons and daughters of the Most High. Right? We are the, we are the offspring of the infinite. And so if we say, oh, I'm no good, I'm not worthy, what happens is our subjective mind takes that and runs with it. It seeks to carry that out. Remember, I don't know about you, but when I was young, kids used to say, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. You know, so no matter what you say or do to me, I'm still a worthwhile person. Now, you know, I know a lot of people go around with this notion that the universe is out to pull the rug out from under them. That God's just waiting for an opportunity, you know, to push them over the edge or trip them up in some way. I'm, I'm completely the opposite. Science of mind has been great for me in this way. I'm an inverse paranoid. We all know what paranoid is. I'm an inverse paranoid because I think the universe is going behind my back, always trying to do me good. Right? And I like that. That largely works for me. Why? Because it's done unto you as you believe. It's done unto you as you believe. So if you think the universe is trying to bring good into your experience of life at every turn, that will be more of what you experience. But if by the same token you think, oh, the other shoe is always going to drop, then that will also be your experience. I think that we say some words that are almost like spells. You know, magic is very popular on TV right now. And I think those spell words that we have to eliminate are words like can't, and oughta, and shoulda, woulda, coulda, if only. Right? Um, I don't know if any of you have read Rapunzel lately. Uh, I have a wide and varied reading list. Uh, but in the story of Rapunzel, you know, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair so I may climb the golden stair. Anybody remember that, or is it just me? Okay, anyway, um, Rapun in Rapunzel, the witch, the witch in Rapunzel convinces her that she was ugly and that because of that, she never has the confidence to leave the tower that the witch has placed her in, right? So it wasn't that she was completely locked in the tower, it's that the witch had convinced her of something that wasn't true. I think, oh, wow, where do I get convinced of things that are not true? You know, wh where do I believe stuff that other people say or that the news, the media says that I know is just not so, but, oh, I listened, I listened. They said it with such conviction, you know, or they're older than me or smarter than me, so they must know more. Well, I think it comes down to very, very basic things to remain in well-being, and I'm hoping that as we move forward, we're going to practice this. So there was a very well-known psychologist, Virginia Satir, and she said this years ago, and I have always loved it, that everybody, everybody needs four hugs a day for survival. For survival, you need four hugs a day. And I don't know if you're getting them, but I really hope that before you leave today, you will at least no, no, I can't say be in survival. That's really a low vibration. We want to be much higher up than survival. So Virginia Satir says you have to have eight hugs for maintenance. Ooh, huh? I'm liking that. That's, no, but, but, but still, we're just in maintenance, right? She says we need 12 hugs a day for growth. And I think, wow, 12 hugs a day. That's a lot of love, isn't it? Isn't that, but that doesn't mean that we're just out to get that love. We're out to give that love. You know, because always, always it's important to think of what is it that I have to give, right? Because you have to give before you get. So four hugs a day for survival, eight hugs a day for maintenance, 12 hugs a day for growth. You know, people talk about this idea of loving themselves as if it's um, a very airy-fairy kind of thing. What it is, is you're taking responsibility for your life. You know, and when you approve of you, when you have a personal high regard for you, you give off a good vibration. This wonderful frequency emanates from you, and people know it, and they like it, and they want to be around you. Have you ever heard that expression, well, they threw away the mold when they made you? I've heard that a lot. It wasn't usually in a good way. Um, <laughs> 
But I think, well, thank God. For all of us, thank God, because you know God made only one of each and every one of us. We are not supposed to be the same. You know how boring life would be, how boring earth would be if we were all, all the same, if everything was always, always predictable? So you know, how you see yourself ultimately determines how others see you. It's wired that way. How you see yourself determines how other people see you. And nobody, nobody, we learned from wonderful Eleanor Roosevelt years ago, nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. Now, why would you concede? Why would I? Don't do it. Just don't do it. Mm -hmm. I know we're here for a high purpose. Everyone is. I believe that that's so. So think about this this week. Four. Eight, 12 <laughs> on the hugs. And nobody can make you feel bad about yourself without your consent. Don't consent. Let's pray. Thank you. So we'll turn our attention inward for a moment to just remember that right here where we are, God is. That we are surrounded, we are filled with this infinite loving presence, the Spirit of God reveals itself uniquely and perfectly as each and every one of us. So I know we're connected with God, and I further know that we are all connected with each other in the infinite invisible, on the unseen side of life. And so I speak the word for each and every one of us here today. I speak the word that the world that we experience, that it is our own subjective consciousness objectified. How we feel about ourselves has everything to do with how we experience the world. And I claim for each and every one of us that we know we are emanations of divine mind. We are emanations of God's light and love on earth. I speak the word for us that we are open, willing vessels for spirit's love. That we are here to give that love out into the world and to receive it and to keep our thinking uplifted so that the world becomes a better place for everyone. I know that this is the truth. I know that healing is available to each and every one of us today, and we claim it. We absolutely say yes to it. So we include in our prayer our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of those we love and hold near and dear, and we say right where they are, God surrounds them. God fills them. God is healing them right now. So we let our prayer be a blessing in the world. So everything that's going on out there, is a reflection of what's going on in here. And so we claim a peaceful world, a loving world, a harmonious world, where everyone's needs are met, where peace and love are the order of the day. We bless our church, we bless all churches. We bless synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. Because in truth, on the unseen side, there's only one. One mind, one love, one heart, and we're all it. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I say thank you, God, that this is the truth. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say amen. <laughs>